I often like to think about how objects can fill certain kinds of critical silences. My name is Krista Grensevich. I use the pronouns she, her, hers. I'm a dissertator at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, where I'm a lecturer in women's and gender studies and teach introduction to women's and gender studies. Threshold concepts like understanding privilege and oppression and how those systems are interrelated, understanding intersectionality and how our identities dictate the ways in which we experience systems of privilege and oppression. These are central ideas, central concepts, core to creating women's and gender studies scholarship. Objects can offer us insight into the lived reality of individual people, how they react, participate, resist, and belong. Abby Nye is the director of archives and Max Yella is the head of special collections at the Golda Meir Library at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. In collaborating with archives and special collections and incorporating objects in the classroom, it gave students an opportunity to use these concepts and to think like a practitioner of women's and gender studies in their own right. We sat down before the semester even started and sketched out what objects would be appropriate for which sessions. For the session on consent, we brought out dolls that were used for curriculum and MPS to deal with sexual assault and sexual violence that were uh, created by Women Against Rape, which is an organization that was active in the, in the 1970s, primarily in the city of Milwaukee. These women were responding to an incident where a woman was out jogging in the neighborhood, she was assaulted, and the Milwaukee Police Department's response was, well, women should be jogging out alone in you know, the community. They started this organization to do a number of different things. They would advocate for adult and children survivors of rape and sexual assault, and often that meant going and presenting evidence and being advocates in court situations. A lot of times what they found was that children who experienced sexual violence didn't know the proper terminology for different body parts, and so when they would present evidence or try to like tell people what happened, people wouldn't get it or wouldn't believe them because they weren't using the appropriate terms. So these dolls serve a couple of functions. They allow children to kind of play with them, become comfortable, and then use it all to identify like where I was hurt. You know, this is what happened. Um, and they also served as a, a teaching tool to just say, you know, like, here are the different body parts, here's what they're called. Because at that time, people often weren't teaching kids that. They originally made these dolls with the brown cloth for skin. Some people felt like these were racist representations. They created a second set of dolls where they, they were a little more racially ambiguous. Green hair. <laughs> green hair, yeah, green skin here. So I wasn't the only person to collaborate with Max and Abby in the archives and special collections. Students also developed a collaborative relationship with the archivist and the head of special collections. I could see it in their faces, just being aware that I should not think of these in the 21st century way, and yet I need to analyze this from a 21st century perspective. It challenged them to see themselves as authorities, and they could say something about these objects, about how they were related to systems of oppression, about how we can use an intersectional lens to look at a doll and think about how and why it was created, and who would have used it, and what their experience might have been. We don't ask students to wear gloves. There's all kinds of reasons, but one of my primary reasons is because I don't want to put a barrier between the researcher and a potential research possibility, and that could be touch. Um, with Abby's dolls, for instance, I think touch could be a really important aspect of the research process because touch was important in the production of those dolls and why they were created in this particular way. They were meant to be touched. I loved watching the students, you know, touch the dolls and sort of manipulate them in their hands and of course, you know, very powerfully in a, sen in a session about consent, you know, they felt very uncomfortable taking the clothes off the dolls um, to, you know, kind of see what was under the bathrobes. They're like, 
I don't know, I feel very awkward about this, which I thought raised some really interesting discussions. I felt that it was really symbolic about consent and boundaries. Like, this is kind of consent, I'm understanding your boundaries, take your time pointing things yeah. out. Like, it doesn't have to be this, We like, you don't have to feel naked right now type of thing. Yeah. And like, I feel like it was very, like, I don't know, I get this like therapeutic type of like vibe. Like, I didn't even go near the dolls, honestly. In saying, it's not my place, and interrogating what my place is. Whether or not it was happening in an explicit way and that students were saying, well, this is my identity and this is why I can't touch this doll, or this is where I'm located and that's why I can't remove the bathrobe from this doll. Whether or not they were being explicit about what those identities or places or locations were, this is something that was happening in all of our minds. Where we are located, how our identities fix us places, how our changing identities might fix us in a different place. What we did in these facilitated object lessons had to do more with active listening than with any attempt to give or to recover voice. This idea of listening actively means that we're incorporating these different kinds of disciplinary tools and concepts into the ways in which we listen. When I think about the role of the archivist, I think of us as keepers of memory, preserving different voices. As an archivist, my job is to go out and try to bring in those voices um, that maybe haven't been heard before. Um, so that we're, what is represented in the archival record is not just the opinions of people in power. It's facilitating and supporting and documenting the voices of people who perhaps are underrepresented. Perhaps their voices have not been heard before.